Thank you everyone uh, for um, joining us today for this uh, special Nevada Historic Society American Gaming Archives program called Lady Jesse. And it's a kind of a special program. It's kind of our uh, virtual uh, fireside chat that we do with American Gaming Archives. And we thought this was a, a, a good program because of kind of how everything came to be with uh, a donation and video and experts. So we just thought this would be a nice program that we wanted to put on uh, just to have people enjoy um, and learning something about Jesse Beck. For those of you that don't know about um, the Historic Society's American Gaming Program, um, it was created back in 2006. It's an archives and um, gambling history that we incorporate artifacts and manuscript materials on manufacturers um, across the United States and the Caribbean. And so it's it's a it's an amazing collection that we have, and uh, we have a wonderful expert, Howard Hers, that is so knowledgeable. He is our gaming expert and curator that helps us um, collect and try to tell stories. What's fun about this collection is that uh, we're really trying to document stories, stories about the people and the casinos within our state, as well as um, owners and the everyday people that uh, worked in the casinos. So it's, a, it's an amazing collection. And so keep an eye out for other programs that we'll be um, promoting down the road. So. Today, our two speakers are going to be talking a little bit about Harold's Club as well as Jesse Beck. Um, but Jesse Beck, if, if some of you have not um, heard about her before in the past, she's not the school teacher that is named um, at, in honor with the elementary school. That was something I learned uh, mm -hmm. uh, as we were getting ready for this program. But also, um, she actually was the first woman in Nevada to own uh, a major Nevada casino. And that was back in the in seven in this early 70s. So um, that's that's an amazing feat and and such a wonderful woman that you'll learn about today. Uh, she uh, came to Nevada and worked at Harold's Club and later on was able to purchase the Riverside Hotel in 1970. And what's special is what um, started this conversation about a video that was created. She uh, really supported the military um, during the Vietnam War and afterwards, and especially uh, the Navy. In her honor, they actually named a naval plane in her honor, Lady Jessie. I'm happy to introduce our uh, participants for today's program. Neil Cobb is an expert on Harold's Club and Casino Operations, and CJ um, Resley is an expert on Jessie Beck. And then after we um, have our, our speakers uh, talk, we'll then present the video that was created out of the Sacramento PBS station. Um, and it gives a wonderful history about Jesse Beck. And the video is about 27 minutes long. Neil Cobb is a local historian and our honorary curator for the Historic Society. And uh, Neil is our host for the monthly series Shootout with Neil Cobb. And that's a wonderful series we do every month with wonderful local experts. So if you haven't seen that, check out our website. And um, CJ Wesley, Jesse has worked to promote, um, uh, uh, CJ is promoting um, Jesse Beck's legacy and um, came to us to uh, make a donation and the conversation has developed and we have a wonderful collection now of some correspondence, photos, um, newspaper articles, awards, and promotion materials relating to her family, um, time working at Harold's Club and the Riverside Hotel. And it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity um, that we're, we're so appreciative to have gotten. Um, so we'll get this, this going. So let me ask Neil, first of all. Neil, you worked at Harold's Club. What can you tell us about working there um, and share some history about Harold's Club um, and also being a dealer there? Well, there's always a, a fun thing uh, to talk about. And I say fun because they advertised as the fun place to have fun. Uh, 
come on down and it's all family style and we had all kinds of things going on entertain the kids they had a motion picture uh, facility to go ahead and uh, keep them entertained but you wanted to pre present yourself as somebody that actually cared about people going to the effort to come and visit you at Harold's Club and they you wanted to lay out the carpet, uh, the welcome carpet. And so what it came to be is that if you didn't like people, you weren't going to be an employee at Harold's Club or anybody else that was affiliated with them. You had to be able to come across with a smile and say, welcome, and we're glad to see you. They went as far as to find out one time from human resources that they had people working for Harold's Club from every single solitary state in the nation and all territories. Well, that's a fun bit of trivia, but what do you do with it? Well, this is the beginning of the name tags and they read Harold's Club proudly presents Neil Cobb. Yeah, this or Neil at, at the time. So. Uh, th this was something that uh, that came across for a reason. He says you wanted to include where they were from, and so what, guess where the people from Wyoming went? Well, they went over to see Gertrude Lean. That's where she was from. Was Wyoming? Uh, you had people from Tallahassee, and it would be the same thing. The people coming in from Florida would go over there, and they'd want to visit, and they'd want to know where to go and what's going on, and where did the, where did all of these guns come from, and uh, all the questions that would come across just on a friendly conversation across the table. They encouraged that when most of the gaming facilities, it was all business. There was none of the talk. In fact, that's what uh, killed the MGM here locally when they first opened up, is that they said, you will pay attention to the cards and you're no visiting, no telling jokes, none of this stuff. So but a Herald's Club was absolutely different uh, because they wanted to break the ice. That was, that was an icebreaker that introduced our dealer to somebody else and they were identified by where they were from. Now, the one gal from Puerto Rico, she had a, a, quite, quite a gathering there one day. Uh, they, they were singing her happy birthday. So the same way and uh, with one of the gals that was from Hawaii. If you have ever heard happy birthday sung in Hawaiian, yeah, you, you just really haven't heard anything. So it, it was a fun place to be, but it was, a, a focus on honest, straight shooting, by the book, honesty, and friendliness. Harold's Club was unique in, in its application right from the get-go. It wasn't what, like it was uh, run over on Center Street before gaming went out, and then when it came back in, you had some of the same uh, operators. Well, Harold's Club in 1935, they changed things. And guess what? People really like to come over and be uh, comfortable and know that they were getting a fair shake. So th this was, uh, you know, just, just beautiful stuff that we had. It was like a family. Uh, they uh, went ahead and they uh, threw out the, for the whole, for a person's whole family up at the restaurant, they had a full blown dinner and celebrated with one of the the uh, banana nut cakes for the birthday and, and, and the whole works. So it was, it was great stuff. The Herald's Club Pioneers was formed to celebrate the camaraderie established by an ex-employer. There's no, nobody ever heard of such a thing. That's amazing. So can you tell me too, I mean, you know, you have people and the stories of, you know, them putting the signs and really promoting coming to Reno and the highway or interstate coming through. Um, but was there a lot of local people that would come in as well? Absolutely. And I just mentioned that banana nut cake, uh, the word got out on that and people would come in and order one of those. And of course, while they were waiting for it, they'd play a slot machine or something else. But th they knew that uh, uh, the, the 
the most honest club that there ever was. They wanted to make sure that they could protect a, an enterprise. And the only way to do that is make sure it was a clean run and you, you could sort out the bad guys. Can you tell me a little bit about the significance of Harold's Club hiring women as dealers? And I know that's an important part to point out that a lot it, of casinos really did not have women early on. Oh, they, they, you know, it was all a, it was a men's club. <laughs> well, what <laughs> happened was World War II and you had to fill the void. You had to keep the tables open. You had to be able to entertain all of the, the troops that were coming through. That's where they really had a chance to lay out the red carpet for all of the guys that were going uh, to San Francisco and being deployed to the Pacific Theater. So the very first was, of course, the Harold Smith's wife was the first dealer. And then, of course, Delo Dolores Rose uh, after that as an outside. But it, it turned out that the ladies, and, and one of them would have been uh, Jesse Beck, were so good with their hands and the numbers. They were excellent mathematicians and they could really control what was going on. The numbers played it all, you know, <laughs> so uh, th this was important. And then they found out that, my God, women like to come to the clubs now. There was women dealers. And so it opened up a whole new customer base because they were welcome. They were treated with respect. And, and of course, that same old wonderful, uh, friendly, uh, welcome mat. That's the way we did things at Harold's Club. You were mentioning uh, like math skills. What kind of skills were required for being a dealer? You had mentioned, you know, being friendly, <laughs> being able to keep track of math, but um did you have to already kind of know how to be a dealer? Did they train no, you? No, no. Uh, they trained different than Harris at a school to go ahead and, and train. Oh, we okay. were, uh, this was in-house. And it was uh, when I first was dealing crap, I was up, up getting a two-week instruction from uh, Dutch Vanderholt and from uh, uh, Jim Webster. Uh, and what this was all about is, teaching you the basics, the mechanics of it, what the odds paid as far as uh, on the line and what they had on place and your numbers and the hard ways in the field and, and so on. And so what happened after that on the two weeks, then they threw you down to the dice five, which was the dime table <laughs> located on the corner of Lincoln and Douglas Alley. We had a quarter 21 table that was run the same way. And all of us had to be able to run Chuck Luck and the 21 if, in case you had to fill in and the craps. You can make mistakes. You can allow these guys before you finally dummy up and catch somebody pressing a bet. Uh, you're not going to lose a, a, a whole lot of money. It's not like the big tables where they could really make a score. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah, I, I got a round of applause, uh, applause the first time I was able to actually catch a guy pressing the bet. Everybody thought that was a, oh, yeah, that was wonderful, Neil. You finally got him. <laughs> well, you know, this is, but this is what, what happened. Lots of fun things happened at, at Dice Five. And I tell a story about the, the $1,000 bill where I shortchanged the guy. I was so happy about <laughs> Yeah, I, I was so happy about uh, being able to cut out. You practice cutting your chips and cutting uh, your silver. We were working with silver dollars at the time. And so what had, what had happened, the guy, you know, he put down a thousand dollar bill and I was so excited that I looked at it as a hundred dollar bill. I'd never seen a thousand dollar bill. And so I, okay. I cut him out 80, 80 in reds, which are $5 checks and uh, $20 in silver. And he commenced to just piss it away in the, the, west, the worst bet on the table as the field. And he, <laughs> and, he, and he lost it all and he takes off. And when he come back, he says, Mr. Dealer, could I talk to you for a second? And he says, yeah. I said, there's a chance that you might have shortchanged me. And that, so then you hit the buzzer and here comes Chuck Webster and <laughs> security and all that. And they tell the story. And of course, when they pulled, uh, dropped the box, which they could do in, in the early 60s, there was that $1,000 bill in there. 
<laughs> but I, I, I was so intent on making sure I could cut out everything that matched. Uh, uh, so that, that I loused up there. But I had one thing I want to talk about Jesse Beck for just a second, because yeah. I can say that I met her, but it was it wasn't. It, <laughs> here's the story. This lady walks in the back corner and she walks right up to the table and she wanted to see Joni Clark because Joni had worked for her as a Kino writer and wanted to go where there was better side money. And so she wanted to learn the craps and, and, and be a dealer, which is where that would, would be. So they, this person come over and, and she said, Joni, how are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing just fine, da, 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 da. And she glanced over at me and says, Neil? And I says, good morning. And that was it. That's, I met Jesse Beck. Well, I had to ask Joni afterwards. I says, who was the lady? And so she said, well, that, that's Jessie Beck. I says, well, yeah, what, what does she do? She says, she runs the <laughs> Kino. She's the, the, the whole work's on there. And it wasn't until I got to the, the, the break room and I was sitting there with Lee Crawford, who was married into the family too. And he explained what a valuable person and what an honorable relationship that Harold's Club had with an inside entrepreneur. And this was Jessie Beck. Uh, she, wow. she was a, a dealer. In fact, she was the, uh, well, I'll, I'll let CJ uh, talk about that part because she had another first that he can tell you about. Can you just briefly mention before we um, start talking with CJ um, about Smith's playbook? I know um, that's kind of comes into play about uh, her story and, and um, supporting the troops and, you know, can you talk briefly about that before I start asking CJ I'll, some questions? I'll tell you what, they had to, to get along like they did for all of those years, you know, at, running her, after her husband passed away in 54, mm -hmm. she took over all the, uh, the concessions there with the Kino and race book and the uh, pan and the, the rest of it. And so uh, what, what you had to, to to work with was um, a person that really knew the the games and the rest of it. But uh, how, how do you uh, get along otherwise? Well, they're all, they were big time patriots. The military was was super as in their book, and they're going to support them in any possible way that they could. And so this is one of the other things. Not only did they work well together uh, as far as the business, but they saw eye to eye as far as the value of the people that are protecting this country. And, and that, that flowed well. And it, there wasn't anybody around that I ever met at Harold's Club that didn't, I mean, it, proud to be an American, just absolutely proud to be. And, and, like and who, who's making it possible? <laughs> well, it's the same guys that are laying down their lives for you. Guys and gals, I don't want to leave the ladies out of there. It's the other part of Harold's Club is, is that when you were part of Harold's Club, you were part of a team and a family. Let me pop over and start asking CJ some questions since he's the expert on Jesse. So CJ, so can you tell me how you are acquainted with um, Jesse Beck? Well, she was my great grandmother and she was nationally known as the gambling grandmother during that period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I grew up um, with a, I guess a famous <laughs> great grandmother <laughs> was it was a wonderful lady. I mean, I, she she treated our whole family just exceptionally well, and she was the matriarch for sure. You were mentioning, you know, um, the gambling grandmother. Um, can you talk a little bit about how she came to Reno um, and then uh, became the gambling grandmother? Well, the the story is murky at best but she came to reno in 1938 with uh her youngest son and she was uh had a bad relationship with the husband uh, ray brown 
and uh, she kind of fled, was fleeing him, and her sister was acquainted with Pappy Smith in some shape or form, and she came, okay. and then she ended up starting to work at Harold's Club, and eventually she became the director of personnel at one point in the 40s, and then ended up marrying Fred Beck, who had the, the concession for the pan poker, uh, the Kino, and I guess now the race book. I learned something from Neil every time I talked to him. And uh, anyhow, so I was like, oh, she was doing the race book too. But anyway, um, so then, and then he, as he mentioned earlier, he, he passed away in 1954 and then she took over the Kino game and the, that concession until Howard Hughes purchased the the Harold's Club in '69, I believe. Howard Hughes, he 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 purchases Harold's Club, but how did Jesse get the money to buy um, the Riverside? So <laughs> tell a bit about that story. This is a good story. Well, anyway, I guess after he purchased it, she was still working there just as normal, and uh, then I guess some of the Howard Hughes people came in with a, a check for one hundred seventy five thousand dollars, which to us, that'd be pretty good. But she goes, this, I'm, this is a $3 million a year business. And there's no, you know, I'm not accepting $175,000 for this business. And uh, so she held out and I don't know if there's a lawsuit or anything, but finally Howard Hughes came back with $3 million. And then she took that money, purchased uh, the Riverside, which had been vacant for, I don't know how many years and uh, refurbished it and uh, got our own gaming, our own hotel casino in the Heart of Reno. How long did she run the Riverside Hotel and Casino? It opened, I believe, in 1971, and then she sold it to, uh, in 1978. And uh, okay. that was another interesting deal. They sold it to Hera, Hera the Harris Corporation, and they okay. transferred it to another guy that owned... Uh, casinos named Pitt Copson and and so it was kind of a, a three-way deal there. How old was she when she actually bought the uh, Riverside Hotel? Well I'm gonna have to do math. Oh. <laughs> she was probably I see she died. Sorry in, to put you on the spot there. <laughs> died in 83 and 87. So she was in her 60s. Can you talk a little bit about Jesse meeting um, um, Dick Perry um, and her relationship with him? Um, yes. How did they meet, and and then that story, how it evolved? Yeah, as far as I know, he came to work uh, for her at um, in probably the late fifties while he was going to school at you know, University of Nevada. He was from Carlin, and uh, he was working with her at the Kino Concession, and um, she fell in love with him. I mean, not in that sense, but in as a person, she really liked Dick Barry, <laughs> and. He, from all accounts, he was a really great guy. Anyway, he was going to school, and then he became a naval aviator um, uh, in the early 60s. And okay, uh, okay. she supported him and followed him um, through his uh, early career. And uh, then he ended up becoming a member of the uh, the, the Ghost Riders, the 164 uh, uh, squadron that flew missions, dangerous missions. Uh, in the Vietnam War. Okay, so because she, you know, felt a connection with him, because he, like you said, he was going to UNR and working with her um, when she was still working at Harold's Club, uh, running the concessions. Um, what what was the significance? She started sending packages and other stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? And sure. that evolves. This, because this program. And I, I think that had to do with the Herald's training that Neil was talking about supporting your troops like during other conflicts. Well, she had her man, Dick Perry, um, I mean, on their missions. So she would send pallets upon pallets of things to make uh -huh. their missions more comfortable, cards, foodstuffs, um, books, board games, whatever she could um think that they would want in fact she's and you'll see in the move in the in the documentary that they she sent so much stuff that they were sharing with other ships and other squadrons and 
and That's and it right. and it wasn't exclusive to the Navy. Um, it would anybody that any serviceman that asked her to to uh, you know say I'm on a mission here or whatever, she would send them pallets of stuff as well. So it wasn't just this. She did it for everybody. As I say, because even after Vietnam, she was still supporting the troops and and didn't she give good deals to awesome. veterans that came to Reno as well? Well, yeah, especially during especially during the okay. conflict um, when they were on leave or whatever, she would even when they were at the Herald's Club, she would invite them. She'd have big banquets for them. I'm pretty sure she took care of their their rooms, their food, maybe gave them a couple hundred dollars to gamble with or some spending money. But yeah, she, I mean, there's, we have many photos of her and their wives, the pilots and their wives or whatever. She would throw these gigantic banquets and sometimes they'd have to use other properties in order to accommodate the size. Like the Nugget, I think was one of the bigger properties during the, that period. And because there's a lot of photos that I've seen that were at the Nugget, even though she had, their, she had the end at Harold's Club, Dick Perry ended up getting shot down um, in uh, uh, 1967, I believe. And uh, then she just, going back to her sending things to the ship, the guys say that she kept it coming and it came even more. She even sent more stuff after um, Dick Perry was killed in action. Let us talk about uh, one other thing. I want to have you mention um, about the naming of the plane in Jesse's honor. I mean, was mm. that a typical thing they did in the Navy um, to name planes? No, uh, especially for the Vietnam conflict. I mean, prior conflicts, and yes, they could put no, what they call nose art on the plane. And uh, the Department of Defense or the Pentagon, or whoever it was, they said no nose art for the Vietnam conflict. And uh, since she was supporting them so greatly, um, the guys made up Lady Jessie for uh, the A4 Skyhawk. And uh, they go, well, you're not supposed to have nose art on the plane. And the Admiral said, they got to go through me because she, she definitely does. She definitely deserves to be uh, on the plane. And it, Turns out that that Lady Jessie, it, it was the most popular model airplane decal package for the A4 Skyhawk uh, during that period. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. It's, it, it is. How did the video come to be um, with the Sacramento um, PBS station? Well, um, one of the pilots, and he's Mike Mullane. You'll see him in the documentary. He his. Um, his cousin is named Jim Eckes and his wife, Suzanne, they do video productions and uh, commercials for the Sacramento area. So when they did the dedication to the plane in uh, Pensacola, Florida in 2016, he didn't want to just have a panel of, of guys standing up there talking about this and that, uh, the history and everything. He wanted to have something more because he felt so grateful for Jesse Beck. So he got them together and they put together a 16 minute documentary, which there's parts of in this one. And then uh, they went to uh, the Sacramento PBS station and um, they got sponsored to turn it into a, a 30 or 26 minute uh, film or documentary. And uh, so they, then they fell in love with the story as well. And uh, most people that see this also fall in love with the story. It's amazing that I'm a family member and I feel honored. And, and I'm so glad that we started this conversation initially because you were moving and, yeah. and you, you know, and then oh, it yeah, I had to go through all the box collection and learning about her story more and the video. So um, what we're going to do now is uh, show this amazing video called Lady Jessie in the Vietnam Story. Let's um, switch on to the video. So I think everyone will enjoy this. Pilots, you know, have this history from World War I on of, you know, the Knights of the Air, and they paint their airplanes, they have fancy helmets. But by the time the Vietnam War started, 
the Navy had said, you know, no personalizing the airplanes. The only exception was an aircraft named Navy Jesse. The way that it came about that there was an aircraft that had no czar on it was because of two very special people, and that was Lieutenant Commander Dick Perry and Lady Jesse, who was Jesse Beck. Jesse Beck had come to Reno in 1938 as a young divorcee, brought her little boy along, and she had come there from Texas because she had been promised a job by Pappy Smith. Pappy Smith is credited with laying the model out for Reno casinos. His son had a little tiny gambling outfit called Harold's. Jesse was um, gregarious, easy to talk to, natural leader. By 1950, she had risen in the casino and she fell in love with and married Fred Beck, who owned the Kino betting concessions. As the casino grew, so did their business. Fred Beck died in 1954, about the time Dick Perry was in college. Dick was raised in the small town of Carlin, Nevada. He was someone who was a natural leader, hardworking. He always had a smile and he was uh, enthusiastic and optimistic. He got a job at Harold's Club while he was in college. His job was working for Jesse Beck as a, uh, at first as a runner, just running um, tickets around the uh, place. He and Jesse hit it off. It was a, kind of a work mother, work son kind of relationship. Uh, and they became good friends and she mentored him there. And he ended up, as I understand it, at one point he was the youngest licensed pit boss in the state of Nevada. Dick finished college and then entered the Navy's flight program. His orders took him to Naval Air Station Lemoore, California, to join VA-164. Dick Perry was one of those few very special people who stay in the most vivid part of your memory for a lifetime. He was full of the V's of humankind, verve, vigor, vitality, and just an uncommonly huge bunch of love for just about everything. Family, friends, flying, you name it. What Dick touched, he loved with a passion found in but a very few. He was a superb pilot. He was a, a really excellent naval officer, and he was just a good guy. I mean, he was a good man. Dick Perry was not just a you know, a good leader and a courageous combat pilot, but a man of integrity in an old school Navy. Jesse followed his career after he left college and went into the Navy. She stayed in touch with him. She had read newspaper stories about morale and issues such as that. So she put together care packages to send to Dick and his friends. But Jesse Beck did everything in a large way. It was, hey, there's a package from Jesse in the ready room. There was all these boxes and take anything you want. Cards, cookies. Poker chips, popcorn. Anything that could be shipped. It wasn't just that she uh, was writing checks. She was getting other people involved. Can I help you? She got, I think it was the telephone operators across the state of Nevada to get donated paperback books. And they put them in these huge cartons. I mean, we had books coming out of our ears, so we scattered them all over the ship. And when the next box arrived, we started scattering them to other ships. Dick wrote back and said, this is, you're sending too much. I gave some of it to the other squadron, VA-163, the other A-4 squadron. And she uh, took them under her wing and started sending even more stuff. 
three, four foot by three, four foot boxes of goodies uh, to distribute throughout the two squadrons, and everybody loved it. It seems like such a little thing, you know, to say that there's care packages coming in and they got decks of cards and cookies. But although it was, the war wasn't that unpopular yet, to get anything that recognized you as doing something, you know, for the country or that people were thinking about you was big. We were pretty much out there on our own. Dick became the spirit of the Ghost Riders in those years. He could listen. He knew how to rally the troops. He became a big brother to his wingman, Mike. When I joined the squadron, I was assigned to him to be his wingman. He was going to be my flight leader. And I thought, I have lucked out. My Irish luck is holding, you know. I am flying on Dick Perry's wing. And I knew that before we had our first combat mission because I heard about Dick Perry. He had been on a twilight mission, been hit by anti-aircraft fire, blew the nose off the airplane where all the electronic equipment was stored and it was getting dark. He had to uh, dead reckon back out to the carrier. Uh, the only thing he had was a flashlight and uh, just a Boy Scout compass and he managed to get this very sick airplane on a carrier at night. I mean, just a spectacular piece of airmanship. We lost half of our pilots that cruise, many in a fire aboard our carrier, Oriskany. I was sleeping, the fire alarm went off. We didn't get 10 or 15 yards before I knew we weren't gonna make it. I was laying on the floor just with a couple of inches of breathable air. Somebody came down with an OBA and led me out. Smoke was starting to come in under the door. Dick said, I think we better think about getting out of here. I'll lead you out, I know a, a way. When the lights go out on the aircraft carrier, I mean, there is just no light. There's no ambient light anywhere. And it's filled with smoke. But Dick knew where he was and he picked the right place to go to get to fresh air. We lost uh, 43 people and I think 36 of them were pilots. It was a really sad day of many. We had this fire and, and that was a, a terrible event aboard Oriskany. But when we got back, Jesse Beck invited all the officers in VA-164, our squadron, VA-163, the Saints, to Reno. She put us, our wives, girlfriends up for all of us bachelors, uh, she lined up blind dates for us, which was, I, I thought, a, a wonderful thing. I decided to find my own date. She was a local girl and uh, had a Shelby Cobra. She took us to uh, dinners. I fell in love with that Shelby Cobra, but I'm sorry to say it was owned by her husband. <laughs> <laughs> We all got front row tickets for the Patty Page show, and she gave us all $100 of gambling money. I think that's the only time I've ever made any money at a, at a casino. <laughs> My wife and I were playing blackjack one time, and I was not doing very well, and Lady Jessie came and sat down beside us, and I never lost a hand while she sat there. <laughs> just joined the squadron. Dick introduced me, this is Mike, he's my wingman next, is coming up this cruise. And she was just the most gracious, wonderful person. Miss Jessie, she was a wonderful lady. Paul Engel was the commanding officer of 164. Dick asked, and he thought it was appropriate, to paint Lady Jessie, name Dick's aircraft, in honor of Jessie Beck. Somebody asked, Paul, how did you get permission to do that? And he said, I didn't. <laughs> he said, I just did it because it was the right thing to do. July 10th, 1967. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Mullane, tomorrow we leave QB Point in the Philippines and head for Yankee Station in combat. Friday we will fly our first combat hop. And I want you to know that it is with pleasure that I go into battle flying with your son Mike as my wingman. Flight leader got you where you're supposed to go, got you set up to attack whatever the target was. The wingman's job was to keep eyes peeled for enemy fighters, for flak, for missiles. 
This is my second combat cruise, and I assure you, the uppermost thought in my mind is to bring Mike home safely to his family. 95% of the time you flew with your flight leader, and the bond of trust has to be implicit. We've flown together now more than any other seating in the squadron, and are now an unbeatable team. Doesn't have to look over his shoulder because I'm behind him. Uh, and I don't have to watch where I'm going because he's leading. My wife, Margo, and I look forward to meeting you at the end of this cruise. Sincerely, Dick Perry. I grew up around naval aviators. He fit the mold of what you wanted to be when you became a real grown-up. The men like Dick Perry, they had, you know, such courage and integrity and valor that uh, all of us junior officers looked up to that we would have followed them anywhere. Thank God they were there to lead us into this uh, because it was pretty bad starting in July of 67. When you would be about 20 miles from the target, the missiles would start coming. And they're coming, you know, at, at three times the speed of sound. I was shot down the fifth day of the cruise, and I was the seventh pilot to be shot down. I lost three roommates in 67, two which were KIA, and the third was a POW. The plane basically exploded, and I just came out of a ball of fire. I was a replacement pilot. So I came from Travis to QB Point, and then uh, flew the COD out to, out to Yankee Station. I was met getting off the COD by a young pilot. His name was Jim Dooley, and he was shot down really literally about three or four days later. Skip started predicting his demise. Every few weeks he would say, I'm not going to make it home to Janine. He made it till the last week. It was a tough, tough, tough time. And at that time, the Rolling Thunder operation, which was the air war over North Vietnam, just started cranking up to full steam, and we were flying three Alpha strikes a day. August 30th, 1967. Dear Jesse, just thought I'd let you know, I flew the Lady Jesse to Hanoi one day and Haiphong the next, and she brought me home safe and sound each time. Yesterday, I led a strike of 22 airplanes against a bridge on the outskirts of Haiphong, my first major Alpha Strike lead. I'm about to hit the sack as I fly at 5.45 tomorrow. Love, Dick. It was an Alpha Strike, which was a max air wing strike. We were going into Haiphong from the southwest. We flew in what they call a finger four formation. This was Dick Perry, this was me, this was John Davis. We're going in. We had AAA and SA-2s flying all over. That was my first look at an SA-2. I saw one low, I knew he wasn't guiding on me. The SA-2 missile had come very fast. They flew at about Mach 2.5. And if you saw one, you would call the missile launch. And I didn't see this missile launch, I, and I couldn't locate the missiles coming. Somebody said, magic stones break, which meant move, get a maximum evasion. Right at that point, I saw Dick's airplane in almost a 90 degree bank, pulling very hard away from me, you know, just separating from us, from me. And then there was one big whoomph. The explosion buffeted us. When we recovered, Dick was already turning for the Tonkin. He was talking calmly. John said, I'm with him, we're going out. Uh, you go on. So I went into the target. As we reached the coastline, he became silent. His plane caught fire and rolled out of control. But just as it rolled through wings level, Dick ejected. Fine, he's in a good chute, 
the Gila was on the way, I reported over the air. I was in strike ops and um, waiting to hear the feet wet calls from middlemen, listening to the speaker. And that's when I picked up on that Dick had been hit. He was over the beach, good shoot. That was good news. His feet wet, he's over the water. We have a good shoot. If you were over the water and you had a good shoot, we were gonna get you. Uh, you know, your chances were 90%. So I thought, okay, and I'd go back to the strike frequency. It was sort of a silence for a while, didn't know what was going on. And then the uh, helicopter pilot called and said, request permission to leave the scene. Pilot, get in the water, massive chest wound. What do I do? Nobody knew yet. I didn't know, the skipper didn't, so I walked right out the door, across the passageway, to the ready room, where the pilots were briefing for their next mission, including our commanding officer, Doug Mao. I knelt in front of him and I said, uh, Skipper, I said, we just got a report from um, the pilot. Uh, Dick, I think my exact words were, Dick's dead. And he went, thanks, Jim and then went on to what he was doing. The rescue swimmer went down and confirmed him as a KIA. Then shore batteries opened fire. Too risky to continue, we had to leave Dick to the sea. We hit the target, exit, go back to the carrier, I land and uh, I'm walking back to the island and uh, look up and here's uh, the skipper, uh, Doug Mao. And he walked up to me and he says, uh, Mike, Dick didn't make it. Uh, it was a complete surprise because I was just sure he was alive, you know. He, uh, I was flying on the next mission. So I went down, had a couple cigarettes, went to the briefing, and I started to cry. And I couldn't stop, and I couldn't stop. Each night we'd run a movie in the ready room. Everybody is sitting in the ready room kind of stunned, and Denny Weekman, one of the, uh, our lieutenant commander who had flown many combat missions. He came up to me and he said, where's the movie, Don? And I said, you gotta be kidding me. We're not gonna run a movie now, you know? And he said, go get the movie and roll the movie. And that's the way you had to be. You know, you had to, you just, you couldn't get emotionally attached. You had to move on, be, you know, you had combat missions to fly the next day. September 1st, 1967. Dear Dick, I just could not go to bed and to sleep without getting a note off to tell you just how much you're being thought about, both you and my other boys of 164, and how much I love you and them. I'm praying with all my heart that you and all the others are safe and that you will all be coming home soon to your families. I just love you all. And it is all right for me to say that, for I could be the mother of any one of you, and of course I am your second mother. Please give my love to all, Dick, and may God bless you. Lots of love, Jesse. At that first party, Jesse took me aside and she says, Mike, she says, bring Dick home. And I said, 
excuse me. And I promised her I would. I made a promise that it was not within my power to keep, but I promised her I would. I felt awful and, you know, that I'd failed to keep my leader alive. Not only did I care for this man and have this tremendous bond with him, but if he could get shot down, I think anybody could get shot down, including me. Uh, shortly after that, the, I calculated when my life expectancy would expire, and I said, what you, you're not going to survive this. Your, your replacement is not going to survive this. It's strange as it sounds. Once you accepted that, it was like all the worry was gone, and yeah, we're not going to make it out, but okay, I accept it. I mean, it was to that point. You might make it through, you might not. Just do your best and hang on. There's other guys have made it through. It's statistically possible, although it didn't seem very likely. How good you were as a man or an officer or a pilot just didn't matter. It, it was just sheer dumb luck. Air Wing 16 had the highest loss rate of any Navy Air Wing in the war. You talk about people sacrificing, you know, giving it everything they had without the country being behind them. I don't think that the nation really understood. Lives not lived. Then to go home to meet Jessie and talk to her and talk to Dick's widow uh, was really painful. Jessie was, was loving and it was calm and it was supportive. That's who Jessie Peck was. Dick's airplane was Lady Jessie. The skipper always flies 401. After Dick was killed, we put Lady Jessie's name on his aircraft. I don't know exactly who came up with the idea, but all of a sudden Lady Jessie was painted on our number one airplane, 401. Jessie became such a mother to us all. It was just the right thing to do. And it became a tradition in the squadron until the squadron was finally decommissioned. You got to hand it to Jessie. I mean, as crushed as she was, you know, they were very close, but she just carried on. And I can remember thinking, well, if she can be this strong, you know, uh, we can do it. She did more and more. Uh, you know, she had, she was doing things with the Army and the Air Force. She was a phenomenal woman. One of the Army units recommended her for the Medal of Freedom. Now that's the highest civilian uh, medal that can be given. In my mind, it's appropriate that the fame of the aircraft reflects the, the celebration of Jesse Beck uh, and the memory of Dick Perry. We buried Dick in the spring of 1987. Surprisingly, his remains were returned. Standing beside his grave in Arlington, hearing the strains of America the Beautiful, and remembering my stopping by, it seemed to me that so many of America's very uncommon heroes and leaders have sprung unashamedly from the good and common people spread across its heartland. 
Dick Perry was an uncommonly great human being. The heights to which he and thousands other youth from our heartland might have risen, we shall not know. All we can know now is that not knowing is the greatest tragedy of war. This is a question. It was a wonderful tear jerking video. Um, <laughs> I think very clearly it was the sense of family, uh, the fact that it was connected to Reno, uh, a woman that cared about people that she met in her career and she adopted. It was really heartwarming uh, to see that sense of family. To Neil Cobb, you told us the time that you thought that, I mean, that that you actually uh, had a word or she said something to you in the casino. Can you relate that again? You said. <laughs> well, I, I was making fun of myself really because I can say that I, I, I met her, but it was a very awkward and one, uh, basically one-sided. She came over to the crap table to visit with uh, uh, employees that she had working for her in Aquino and had transferred over to make better side money into the, the dealing craps in 21 and so on. Her name was Joni Clark. And she walked right over to the table and she said, Joni, how you doing? And they're talking. And just as a courtesy, she looked up and there was another person. I was the other dealer. And she looked right at my name tag and then she just said, Neil. And I said, morning. And that was it. And I can brag about meeting Jesse Beck. And I didn't even know who she was at the time. I had to ask Joni after that. And I'll tell you what, when Lee Crawford in, uh, really talked about her, uh, it, it was nothing but uh, positive act accolades uh, about a, a wonderful, wonderful woman that just, she's, uh, <laughs> she's part of the team here. And that was that was it. She was uh, highly regarded by all of the em employees uh, there. He was, you know, a team player, even though she uh, was a uh, higher up <laughs> than uh, than the rest of us. She was actually an owner of the French or the uh, an inside purveyor of uh, 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 of uh, other gaming that the Herald's Club didn't want, but uh, want to handle. Uh, but they had to have Kino to be a full uh, service casino. And so she took care of that. That was for sure. And of course, you, you talked about room 25. Uh, that's where the, the pan game was and, uh, and the poker tables off to the other side and so on. And uh, those, those were all part of her. Uh, uh, that's what she owned. But to get along, I mean, uh, until the very, very end. And then when she went to uh, and, and bought the Riverside, uh, she took uh, Don McDonald, who was uh, one of the main players at Harold's Club, one of the, the uh, managers of the casino, uh, as her casino manager, plus a bunch of other people that were all Harold's Club employees in one way or the other, to take care of the gaming part of the Riverside uh, that, uh, uh, but she was pretty well versed also. I was, uh, I wanted to have uh, CJ uh, talk about 
uh, it, it, the uh, first uh, female crap dealer uh, that uh, the state of Nevada ever had, and that was Jessie Breck. She went up through the ranks. Of, she was a, a shift manager in the whole work. She was a talented, talented woman, uh, but she was forced into uh, taking care of some serious business with the passing of her husband. But everybody in that club, I was, I was surprised. I mean, uh, Lee uh, Crawford, he just got bubbly talking about her. It was, it was amazing. I remember it like it was yesterday. So that's Thank my you. impression that she left with so many people. I'm too young to remember her dealing craps, but I did spend my younger years um, when I was from the age of six to I guess 12, uh, every summer since my parents, she had granted uh, my parents the concession for the gift shop at the Riverside. And so I spent, there was no daycare or anything like that. So I spent my whole summers uh, at the pool, messing around in the hotel <laughs> and being around gambling. And uh, I didn't see her too often there because she was sleeping most of the day because she was up all night and she would come down and deal. She was, it was, she was famous for coming down and dealing her, you know, at, you know, after midnight. Um, and, and that attracted a lot of players to, you know, get, get dealt by the owner of the casino. And you know, uh, yeah, you know, there was a radio station that was in the basement uh, on the uh, west side of the pool, you know, the addition. Mm -hmm. And that was that was our radio station. That's where KNEV wound up with the studios. Oh, OK, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I but was I, pretty young. <laughs> I, I, but I, I only saw Jesse one time, and that was the, when she came to see Joni, not me. CJ had mentioned um, playing cards with his his uh, great grandmother, and, and and I just thought it was a cute story. How you know you were mentioning? <laughs> did you win a lot or? <laughs> no, it, it, you couldn't beat her. Uh, which after she sold the Riverside, she had purchased a home and was living in a home. Uh, just a couple blocks from us uh, on Danton Pioneer, and uh, and we were two blocks away. So my mom would, you know, want us to go over and visit her, and we did, and we enjoyed it. You know, we'd kind of go kicking and scratching, but it, you know, once we were there, we really enjoyed it. And she didn't really talk about any of her uh, accomplishments. I mean, we didn't know anything. I didn't. I've only learned about the Herald's Club thing in the last five or six years. But anyway, so you would play Rummy Cube uh, and uh, Gin Rummy, and uh, that was a both both the two games that we played. And she would you you could beat her. I mean, you could maybe once or twice, but for the most part, she'd out she'd out get you every time. <laughs> she didn't even let yeah. you win. No, <laughs> no she may no. have let me win once. <laughs> like for the most part, you weren't you weren't going to be consistently, and she did it to the whole family. She did it to my grandmother uh, and her son John, and and he was yeah, they were all players. You know, they all knew the games. And she, oh, that's she, awesome. Did you, you, <laughs> you mentioned the honors that she got? She did receive from the Department of Defense that uh, 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 civilian merit uh, uh, award. And of course, then the following year, uh, Laxaw gave her the Distinguished Nevada Award. So, and she was she was also written into the the minutes of Congress or the Senate too, for her for her philanthropy or her you know dedication to uh, her country. And um, and then we also have a letter from Gerald Ford thanking her about her special. Um, uh, you know, her special service to the country and, and doing what she has done. Well, there's somebody else we need to thank too. Uh, uh, th this guy by the name of CJ, digging up all of this and being able to honor this fabulous world. Oh. <laughs> and this, well, you know, if, if you didn't do this, it would have never happened. This was a, a, a wonderful show. What a unique story of Nevada history. So wonderful to hear. But I wondered how long did Jesse own the Riverside? From 1971 to 1978. Okay. And who did she sell it to after that? She sold it to uh, 
it was a three-way deal. She had to sell it to Bill Hara or the Harris Corporation, and, in, and they transferred to it to a guy named Pick Hobson. And then he had it up until the early 90s. I'm pretty sure he, until, he had a until, run on it. Until it closed then, is that as yeah. it was mm -hmm. Yes. Where the Harris uh, parking garage is now is where the Comstock was, and that's what Pick Hobson, he owned, and that was part of the trade. Uh, Harris yeah. wanted that property. Right. That You probably you know more about that three-way deal than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harris could put together a deal. That's for darn sure. CJ, uh, your great-grandmother came to Reno with a son. How many mm -hmm. more children did she have? She had another son who was older, and he did not make the the um, he didn't come to Reno. He stayed in Texas. Okay. So you're, so you are related to Jesse Hell. Jesse is there. Her son that came with her to Reno is your grandfather. 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 Yes. Ah. Mm -hmm. And his wow. name was John Brown. Oh, okay. He did, well, because she didn't get married till like 1945 or 46 to Fred Beck. And her her name, she was married to a guy named Ray Brown in yes. Texas. Okay. It, it was quite mm -hmm. a thing for somebody in the late 30s to uh, leave their husband, leave their church in Texas, the Baptist church, and come to the sit, uh, the state of sin, being Nevada mm -hmm. with gambling and prostitution and all that other stuff, and, and, and leave a son behind. He didn't want to come. I think he was 16 at the time, and uh, he didn't want to come. He wanted to stay with his father. And he ended up passing away in the mid seventies from cancer. I never met him. Okay. Um, and one other question to CJ: you said you said that you remember going to the Riverside and just basically having the run of the place because no daycare. Was that when the Riverside had that other extension where the um, uh, I guess it would be the container store and things are there now? Yes, yeah. correct. Oh, oh my that gosh. Was, uh, that was the pool, and there were some, uh, it, and there were some different types of rooms back there. I don't know if I ever gotten into one of those rooms, but there are other. The Riverside, in I, Neil, you can help me out here. Uh, it was right next to the courthouse. Prior to her owning, I mean, it was still next to the courthouse, but prior to that, um, under different ownership, they put a lot of kitchenettes in, in a lot of the rooms so they could fulfill the uh, divorce uh, statute where you had to stay in Nevada for six weeks really? in order to, to get it to get granted a divorce so there was floors I think it was like the third and fourth floor there were most of the rooms had little kitchenettes in them and it, it was kind of a unique part of the riverside um because it was next door to the courthouse. So people stayed there and tossed their rings over the bridge. And, uh, <laughs> and then they, they parted ways with their, their spouses. Wonderful talk. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. When did they demolish that um, part of it, the, the swimming pool and the kitchenettes? And I think there was a yeah. parking garage there too. When did they demolish that? Neil, do you know this? I, I, I might not have been living in Reno at the time when they did that. It, it's been a very recent. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's they were. We were very worried about the uh, the riverside. Uh, we figured it was a goner, uh, and the Mapes was. Uh, they could go ahead and redo that, and so that all came around in in the late nineties, uh, uh, the nineteen uh, nineties, and of course we were able to save the riverside. And the Mapes, they blew it all to smithereens on the Super Bowl Sunday. 2000. Yeah, 2000. This has um, been a really great program. I hope everybody who has attended um, uh, felt like they learned something a little about Harold's Club and and Jesse as well. And and thank you, um, both of you, and for sharing the video. And it just, it was um, a great program. And thank you, everybody. And one final note, um, <clears throat> if you 
um, like these kind of programs and and you have not um, listened to any of our other programs, you can visit our website and watch uh, recorded videos that we have for High Noon and our Dozen Council educational videos. And then this one will be out in a few weeks on our website as well. Um, or if you want to learn more about uh, programs and uh, local happenings, what's going on with the Historic Society, I even created a form on our website that you can sign up to get um, uh, correspondence and emails from from the society. So thank you so much, um, Neil and CJ, um, and of course, Carol and Sam, uh, who are um, hosting the video for us. We really appreciate their dedication to make sure everything worked well for all of us doing testing beforehand. So um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, and thank you to our hosts. Um, and we will say goodbye for today. So have a great day and thank you.